the more tools you've got, the more fun you can have with this hobby. Absolutely. Still sad that mead didn't turn out pink, though. <laughs> Food coloring. Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Homemade brews and various artists, everything from mead to rose. Bake creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. On this episode of Doing the Most, we are in Mead Science Series, episode two. I've got here Corey and Storm. What's everyone drinking tonight? I have a uh, Saison from Side Project Brewing out in Missouri. Mixed culture fermentation, uh, wild yeast bacteria, their whole house culture fermented and aged in wine barrels, and then blended back. Nice. Most places I go to, I say, mm, I could do that. Maybe I throw a little bit more money at it. Maybe uh, my process is better. A thousand reasons for it. Uh, these guys... Not so much. <laughs> I figured open a real damn good pro bottle. And uh, this time it's the uh, Blueberry Chipotle uh, from Manic Meter Meadery. And it's good. It's just as good as I remember it from when we were tasting down there. So very happy to be drinking something fun. Those are some great guys down there. And mm -hmm. that is one of my favorites they've made in a long time. What I've, I've put together here tonight is similar to what we did last time, Storm, where I pulled some posts from Reddit since we are all three active on Reddit, it feels right. And Storm, actually, I, I cropped these because a couple of them you replied to. You Oops. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I felt like we could use these as inspiration to talk through some process stuff, some science behind mead making. And really, I'm going to let y'all kind of have the conversation and, and I'll, I'll nudge it in whatever direction I'd like it to go. But uh, y'all y'all are the experts. Uh, we're here to learn. Starting off, number one, this was posted by a beginner. It says, question about yeast alcohol tolerance and the potential for restarting fermentation. If you were advising a new mead maker who wants to avoid chemical stabilizers and wants to have, you know, halt microbial activity in their mead, what direction would you all push them? Storm, you don't really use chemical stabilizers. I try to avoid it uh, for the most part, yes. I make very big meads. Uh, I am usually well above 18% alcohol, and I don't need to worry about stability at that point. So if you're at what's called this Dell limit, it doesn't ferment. You can argue about how much alcohol and how much sugar that is specifically, but the more booze and the more sugar you have, the less likely it is to ferment. And you can find it by trial and error by adding more honey to it if you don't know where it's going to be for your mead. That's a good way to do it. It just, you got to make sure to have your nutrition good because if you've got a really big high ABV mead and you don't balance it well or it gets too boozy or the yeast are stressed, it can take forever for it to age. Um, a lot of my monsters are, are fit to drink in 90 days, but it takes a lot of effort and repetition to get them to that point. Uh, they can be very unforgiving. At lower ABVs, I like to sterile filter. Um, I'm not sure it's going as well as I th used to think that it did. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe doing a lower level of filtration and then take a poke at UV stabilization, hmm. which is not something that I've seen a lot of people work with yet. Are you thinking um, thin plate filter for that? Or? I am thinking a thin plate filter. I think I can slap that at the end of my brew cart uh, after a 10.51 micron pass and end up with something that maybe keeps a color and aromatics just a little better while still being microbially stable and then also having not to deal with quite so expensive absolute filters because those $45 filters get old really fast. Yeah, that 0.35 that I'm running on the end of my filtration is um, a little pricey, so I get that yeah. for sure. It's uh, not my preferred method for making a sweeter low ABV, but it works great in a pinch. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I like to do, which is um, get it where I want it dry, back sweeten it with a combination of lactose and xylitol or erythritol, unfermentable sweeteners, something that you do a lot or used to do a lot. And then um, I can prime it with just regular dexterous corn sugar, get it to the carbonation I want. That's a little more old school, but it's nice if I want to do something that's bottle conditioned on whatever yeast I'm using, uh, surly aging stuff, that kind of thing. That's a really, really great method. I've had really good success with it in the past. Can we double back a little bit? I want to talk about uh, Dell units and how that mm -hmm. factors in. It's a thing that I think, Corey, I think you may be the first person I ever saw mention it. 
online. And I actually heard it from a friend of mine. <laughs> and I've seen it more and more recently. So it's a thing that folks are picking up on. If y'all could like explain like I'm five, how that works, because there's a calculation, right? Yes, uh, Dell units are actually pretty simple. There's a, there's a value that about 75 to 80 Dell units is considered microbially stable. And what that's going to be is between 750 to 800 grams per liter of sugar, which is absurd, by the way. That is a ton of sugar. Yeah. Um, some of the highest wines that I've seen on noble rot, like Tokai and Sauternes, aren't even at that level. Or the alcohol is actually four and a half times as effective. So 17.5% alcohol is going to be around that-ish, around 78-ish. So... Of course, you can push these. A strong yeast is going to go over them. But if you kind of are slowing down or if you're kind of tapering off at it, it's a good way to actually make a sweet mead at or around a yeast tolerance. I'm still working myself trying to go a little under with that. Yeah. <laughs> Say get something to stop at like 10% with some residual sugar. Mm -hmm. But you need a lot of acidity and tannin to balance it because you're ending at like 1080 and I use a number that's a little lower, uh, 65 to 73, I've heard people use. I don't know if I'd want to do that professionally. Uh, <laughs> I also bulk age mine for 12 months, so I feel a lot more confident putting that into a bottle, especially if it's going to be cellared afterwards. pH isn't even in this uh, equation here, but if you've got a pH of 2.8 versus a pH of 4, well, guess which one is going to be more likely to restart uh, so there's definitely a lot of research that could be done in microbial stability in mead that hasn't been yet. You know, it's still a new, a new product. There's a lot of science that hasn't been covered. People that know me know I make these big tons of fruit meads, a lot of residual sugar. Um, I found like 1045, 1050 at 14% is usually pretty stable, mm -hmm. um, even if you're using a 16%-ish yeast. So yeah. You can kind of tailor that and you can up your residual sugar a little bit, get your, if you have a 12 to 14% yeast, say USO5, you can actually get it to stop a little closer to that 12% at 1065. But again, you need to balance that right. The reason that Dell units kind of exist is actually for your fortified winemakers like port. Because mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're taking an actively fermenting wine and they're putting O to V directly into that wine and bumping the ABV up with the sugar and stopping it that way. So yeah. It's, it's a pretty old school idea and process, but it's being used in other ways currently than just what it was intended for. It's, it's easy to get wrong if you don't understand what's going on with the situation, but it's really, really a solid, simple way if you want to avoid uh, chemical preservatives, which, you know, maybe you want to use oxygen scavenging for Campton. It's, it's not the end of the world. It could be a very good thing to keep your wine from oxidizing, you know, especially at lower ABVs. Well, sorbate has another issue in that over time in the presence of lactic acid producing bacteria, be that a lactobacillus strain, a brett strain that might have it, or malolactic bacteria, mm -hmm. will break down into geranium, like rotting, wilting geranium off flavors. Yeah, I've read about that. And I've had it because I've yeah. tested it. It's really bad. <laughs> Do not recommend it ever. What's the next question? <laughs> <laughs> I just think we've beat the horse to death. Sorry, here. sorry. Probably no, a little bit. That, honestly, that question there was like my pet question. I really wanted uh -huh. to drill into Dell units and stuff because that, that keeps coming up. So question number two, they're asking for advice on a recipe. They're talking about doing some citrus honey, some blueberries in primary, maybe add some blueberries in secondary. Really, I wanted to kind of throw this at you all as a way to open up the conversation on how do you go about recipe development? Because this seems, honestly, just on the surface of it, it seems like a perfectly fine approach. Mm -hmm. it seems like a very doing the most approach. They've, they've got a lot of different things happening in here. I'm curious, when, when y'all are developing a brand new recipe for something big and and fruity and bold where do you start what are your building blocks i really really like to build different recipes i usually start with two big things obviously my uh, abv and my final gravity so that kind of says okay what yeast am i going to be picking 
what vein am I going to be doing this in, you know, and then do I want it to be carbonated? You know, and once you have that kind of dialed down, you can kind of think, okay, what are the adjuncts that we're going to play with? Um, let's say we're taking a look at this one, uh, blueberries. Blueberries and citrus honey go great together. So what I would do is I would say, okay, I want it to be 15% with a little bit of residual sugar because I've got fruit and I think fruit needs a little bit at least. So I do three and a half pounds of uh, citrus honey and that uh, 2.2 pounds of blueberries, that eh, sounds about right. I'd toss it all in in primary and let it ferment. And this is of course, assuming it's my first time working with some of these adjuncts. Be using a 14% yeast, 71B, D47, sure, great. Both those sound good. I would maybe not use D47, but that's because I hate it and that's personal bias and it's not valid at all. It's a great yeast. I just, eh, it <laughs> hasn't worked for me. Any 14% in my opinion would do just fine with that. I think if you did the batch a second time, then you say, okay, what yeast would maybe bring out some strengths that I missed? Um, or maybe if you're going into it in the front side saying, oh, I want this color to be a really important thing to me. But then I would have my mead in secondary. It'd be racked. I'd have my fruit out of it. I'd say, okay, what does this need? I'd probably be saying, mm, the orange needs to be stronger. So I'd go peel a bunch of oranges, take the, uh, the zest off and toss the zest in. And after a week, I'd come back and say, okay, how do I like it? Where is this going? Do I want to go add in more vanilla? Now you're getting to be a couple of different flavors there, you know, citrus, blueberries, vanilla, that all goes well together. And then I'd let that sit mature um, and then once it's clear, that's when I do my acid, tannin, uh, sugar balance. You know, make sure I'm happy with the final gravity, make sure it doesn't need any oak, you know, pick it apart. And then that'd be batch one, I'd put it aside and forget about it for a year and do another one. That took what I learned and then went forward with it. You kind of know my opinions on blueberries. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really, I think I found the way that I like blueberries the most. And the way that I like it is USO5 and American oak. Yep. So for me, I'd go exactly with three pounds of honey and I'd do that 2.2 pounds of blueberries straight up up front, frozen thawed, some form of pectic enzyme and a color preserver. I like OptiRed. Mm -hmm. If you don't get your hands on OptiRed, difficult for you. It's not really necessary, but it can help a lot with color preservation. Mm -hmm. That would give me a one gallon batch at about 1115. Give me 20 points of residual sugar, 25 points of residual sugar. That with the blueberry tannin should be okay, maybe a little sweet. I want it to be a little sweet coming out on this just because I want to keep some of that blueberry sugar. Mm -hmm. And in case my USO5 goes over 12 and goes closer to the 14, I'll still have a little residual sugar to play with. I like the idea of using something like orange, lemon. I really like lemon with blueberry more than orange, but I think that orange could work perfectly fine. Oak, absolutely in secondary, medium toast American, 0.2 ounces per gallon. I like cubes about two to three months. When I'm building a recipe, a lot of what I think first is, what fruit am I gonna use? What profile do I want? Do I wanna use a single fruit? Do I wanna accentuate it with something else? After I've got the fruit, I start tasting through honeys and figure out what honey I want to match it. Sometimes it's actually Costco honey that works perfect. <laughs> Sometimes it's some single varietal that I really don't want to waste on a melomel, -mel, but I do. <laughs> um, I go through, pick the honey, pick the fruit, look at, look up my yeast charts, look up what I've got on hand, see if I can find something that fits. If it doesn't, I try and freeze my fruit and hold off. If I can't, emergency run to the homebrew store or use what I got. <laughs> I cannot recommend enough asking Scott Labs for a copy of their handbook. It'll have so much yeast data in it. Some of this yeast isn't going to be available to you. Just understand that, that you might have to buy it in a 250 gram pouch. Look through your yeast, figure out what kind of profile you want. And you got to match the profiling to the yeast, but you also have to think if you don't have temperature control, what does your brew area stay at? Mm -hmm. If it stays at 65 to 70 degrees, you're kind of in the perfect realm for 71B, USO5, a lot of your traditional yeast like that. Maybe even a size on in a bigger batch. Yes, you could absolutely use your Saison yeast, get it in a bigger batch, five gallons plus, throw a heat wrap on it if you really wanted mm -hmm. to. Bell Saison actually does great at 80, 90 degrees. Yep. But I mean, if you've got a cellar and it stays 55 to 60, D47 is a great choice, DV10 is a nice choice. Getting some of those white wine yeast works really well. 
So this one is asked by an intermediate brewer asking options for straining, particularly it seems they're having trouble with strawberry seeds. Oh, <laughs> which no. makes sense. Rip. Uh, <laughs> Oops. So obviously you don't want to be pouring your mead through a sieve if, if you can avoid that. What would you all recommend, uh, not just for like little tiny seeds like blackberry and strawberry seeds, but pulp and stuff too. What are, what are some best practices for folks who are trying to brew with lots of fruit, but also deal with lossiness? Well, there's a couple ways to deal with it. And it really you say depends one, on, and, uh... and it's really uh, depending where you are in the process. Um, you can suck it up and deal with it, which really sucks. But if you're using too much fruit, like little to no water and just fruit and honey, you uh, can't really, uh, aside from pre-pressing your fruit, get away with bagging it. So you kind of just have to accept the losses and you could, you could use a bladder press at like day five, day seven, press the solids. But I have found some differences in flavor in that. But either have to suck it up and deal with it or you have to kind of work around <laughs> doing a um, CO2 shrouded straining, which is difficult. And I abandoned that project about a year and a half ago. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to deal with fruit. Strawberries in particular create this really muddy, gross, fluffy garbage at the bottom that really you just get it cold and rack off as much clean as you can. Get a little bit of the garbage into secondary if you really have to, to get some more yield out. It drops out eventually, but Aside from bagging beforehand, it's going to be hard to separate without. Uh, bentonite, yes. Pectinase, oh, yeah. yes. Absolutely. Uh, let's start prefacing with the basics for people who aren't necessarily in that. Uh, that's the first half to winning the fight uh, when you are not bagging fruit, uh, is to make sure you just are breaking it down and compacting it as much as possible. Bonus points for using a high flocking yeast. Uh, uh, 1118 versus uh, half a wise in the strain. Guess which one flocks better? <laughs> Beyond that, obviously, there's the bagging fruit, and I am firmly convinced there is a way to get like a carboy-sized stainless steel strainer that you can raise up while backfilling uh, nitrogen or CO2 or something, and, and just have this perfect system that's the best of all worlds. Um, but <laughs> barring that, and so long as you're not using more than like six pounds of fruit per gallon, you can get away with bagging. I know uh, you feel that it increases how much uh, tannin you get out of things. Um, and other issues, especially if you go and squeeze it, and I could 100% believe it, especially if you're playing at like lower ABVs, you could have over extraction of different uh, compounds that you don't necessarily want. Um, I tend to go throttle my bags because I always feel that I have a hard time keeping enough tannin without just going throwing oak at the problem. And as much as I love oak, I do like to have other sources of tannin <laughs> in my life sometimes. If you don't have a ton of fruit, what you can do is you can get the big hop spiders that they use for brewing, like the big basket ones. Mm -hmm. You can put that into your mead and you can actually have it flow into it if it's a bigger mead, if it's sweeter, if it's higher ABV, because the more, the lower the pH, the higher the ABV, the higher the residual sugar, the more resilient to oxidation it's actually going to be. Mm. So you can get away with a little bit more. So you can actually put those baskets in there to get that last little bit and let it kind of go into the air and siphon out. Bag it until you can't. And then when you do have to bag it, make sure you're using all the right enzymes. I think that's about, yeah. about the best um, you can do. Enzyme wise, Wildzyme EXV, that just absolutely shreds fruit to pretty much nothing. Um, you will get the most quickly reforming fruit cap in ridiculous amounts of goop you've ever seen but it will compact it'll break down and it'll fall out if you use bentonite in primary except loss maybe rack to a smaller vessel than you started with and... my losses can be up to 50 percent of my meat at times so yes i had a no water raspberry that i was ecstatic i only got 25 percent loss <laughs> on that, that got heavy fast Okay. A lot of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Maybe this one will be a simple one. <laughs> so this question number four, basically asking, will this much honey, this, this amount of honey overshoot 
the yeast tolerance. So I, I wanted to use this one as a way mm. to kind of pitch to you, what is a yeast tolerance? Is it a rule? Is it can we a pick suggestion? a different yeast for this question so we can have harder <laughs> answers? I, this, this, this is, is an yeast interesting is a, yeast for this oh, question, actually. Such a double-bladed sword. <laughs> but you also know my experience with this yeast, so you know yeah. why it's an interesting question. Well, a lot of other people have told me that they've hit ABVs with this, and I've said, yeah, let's go take a look at your numbers. And there's yeah. always usually a little bit of fudging. That, oh, yeah, I had three pounds of fruit. Well, did you use a refractometer on your fruit to know how much it diluted? Oh, no, it couldn't be that much. Yes, it can. Yeast tolerance. If you want to go ahead and get to your question so that we keep stop interrupting you. <laughs> no, that, I mean, legitimately, that's the question. When you see yeast tolerance marked on a package, what does that mean to you? To me, that means where under normal conditions, the yeast will approximately stop within yep. one to two percent over normally, but possibly one percent under. So say minus one plus two. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And with repeat process and repeat conditions and repeat nutrients and fresh yeast, you can dial it into plus or minus half a percent. That's pretty easy. The thing is being that consistent with everything you know targeting a specific ppm yan you know plus or minus five yan not plus or minus 35 but really being specific with it mm -hmm. and fruit has yan so that's tricky to do but if you go and change the uh, fruit addition by 50 percent it may perform just a little bit differently maybe it's more acidic maybe there's more nitrogen uh, and those variables are not always intuitive yeah, one other thing that I'll add is, um, so the actual question I'm looking at from the uh, Reddit question was three and a half pounds of honey with 71B. Mm -hmm. That's that's a little difficult. Let me pull up a mead calculator just so that, you know, <laughs> I can be sure of myself. Be spot on. Three and a half pounds of honey gives me 1.126. My assumption for 71B is that I'm going to remove 110 points of gravity. So mm -hmm. that would give me an assumption of 1.016. But my other thing that I have an issue with is sometimes when you're between that 1110 to 1130 range, 71B kind of likes to go a little further. If you're lower on the actual sugars when it's at tolerance, it generally goes a little further than if you've got a boatload of resist residual sugar. Ties in a little bit to Dell units on the back end, like we were talking earlier, but I don't know. If you've only got 15 points extra on it, it might chew through that overhead a little bit easier than if you've got 30 points overhead. Especially on a fruit mead. I have found yes. that 71B is more inclined to overshoot. What accounts for the, the probability that it's going to overshoot based on fruit? Is it the added yam that's in the fruit or... The yan dilution? or acid, take your pick. Okay. Oh, um, and this is assuming dilution is already accounted for because uh, gotcha. fruit is obviously 1.05 uh, specific gravity, generally speaking. Uh, you can go measure your must and then go add this known volume of something that's probably about 90% water, maybe 95% water. It depends on the fruit. I mean, obviously, apricots with the seeds in are a little different. You know, so it's it's 90 something percent water, and then you can go. Uh, do a blending calculation to figure out what your real gravity is and bonus points if you use a refractometer on your uh, a little sample of some fruit juice and then you can be really accurate with it. Mm -hmm. If you go use uh, mead calc and target your final volume you can be probably pretty close to accurate just based off the defaults of how much sugar they think are in the various fruits. It depends on how much fruit you're adding and how accurate you need to be if you're okay with plus or minus 005 uh, specific gravity, don't need to worry too much about it. Okay, so question number five, what's the best yeast for a traditional? <laughs> <laughs> we will disagree on this. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Storm and I will strongly disagree on this one because he and I have very different opinions. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think the best traditional you're ever going to make is Lavin 1118. Uh, send that to the moon uh, for 21-22% alcohol and uh, enjoy it as a liqueur. If you only fail to hit and you're like at 20, I just put in more um, uh, 151 or some other uh, high proof alcohol to get it up to that 22% court <laughs> traditional. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, beyond that, any damn yeast you choose, you can make a, a very good mead around, in my opinion. 
each thing has its own strengths. Uh, I guess maybe I wouldn't pick a uh, red wine yeast because I don't think there's anything that's going to contribute to it, but you could pick an ale yeast. Uh, I've had Saison traditionals that were great. Uh, you might need to throw a little bit more in there to get the Saison to really do its thing. But I think honey is so versatile that it's unfair to pigeonhole it into one yeast. I don't think I've ever had, outside of D47, a <laughs> traditional that I thought, man, nah, this, this was just not it. Where I differ from Storm is... Uh... I actually use DV10 if I'm going for a higher ABV traditional. And Storm knows that uh, I prefer it because it's a little less bitter on that alcohol bitterness than 1118. But I also know that he doesn't like it due to a little bit of a flavor difference. <laughs> yeah. And and I use that. It was twice now. And I just, yeah, I, it wasn't my thing. I don't know what it was about it, but it just did not make a good traditional for me. Um, I almost threw it out. Um, I have gone and packaged it. It's sitting in bottles now. Uh, if I don't like it in a year, it's going into someone's still. It'll become lawnmower for, fuel. For lawnmower fuel or uh, hand sanitizer given COVID. Yeah, yeah, hand sanitizer. Yeah. So, yeah, so a traditional is going to be hugely different for the yeast that you use, really, really based on what your honey is. Mm -hmm. To me, I would actually use a red wine yeast for some honeys, buckwheat and avocado blossom. I would use D D254 for either of those. It's got this really nice high glycerol production as well as this like dried dark fruit fig date. Um, it's a really nice yeast for darker honey. Again, back to get the Scott Labs handbook out. Look at your yeast, see what you can get. Pick something that complements the flavors you taste in your honey. And mm. I, I do like it a lot that we don't have the same process as something, but we can sit down and say... Yes, this was made right. There's no way to say that this is the only way to do it. It might be the right way for you, but even if that's the right way for you, you can take a look at someone else who's done it the right way for them and say, yeah, I, I see the merits of this. I like how this was done. How did you do it? And then talk about it and uh, learn more from it. What do we got next? The fun one. I don't yeah, know what we got next. Our bonus. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Disasters. Wrapping this up. Our, our bonus question for this round. Can we get a few mead disaster posts? Uh, think back, really. I don't have to think very hard. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. All right, hit me with them. What's, what's, your, what's your worst mead making mishap? Jack, I'll take my ceiling at 2 a.m. <laughs> you first. Um, all right, take a uh, 7.9 gallon fermenting bucket put 7.8 gallons of mead with fruit in it. <laughs> yeah, just that's a bad idea, especially when your airlock yeah. clogs, especially <laughs> when you know there's no headspace to begin with, especially uh, when your bucket goes and slams the lid against the ceiling of your apartment at two in the morning oh and God. you walk out into the kitchen, smell a ton of fruit, just look up, look down, <laughs> just kind of sigh to yourself and go get the mop. That, uh. that sucks a lot. <laughs> This year was my first gusher. I've been doing this for about 10 years now. And I had a, a half gallon that I was doing. I said, ah, f it. let's go throw some fruit in here. It's probably three quarters fruit. You know, the last quarter water and then obviously the honey in there somewhere. And yeah, I shot the airlock off the top, hit the ceiling. Uh, my my room, I have a, a fully sealed basement. So I just, I took the garden holes out and <laughs> made it all down it wasn't that big a deal but i'm still sitting here i've made fun of people for fermenting in glass for how many years and i did it like an idiot and that's exactly what happened i had a bucket lid come off on the first day of a vacation very very oxidized mm. it was in primary already about three weeks i was gonna rack it right when oh, i got no. back from vacation oh. i came back and the lid isn't even sealed on it at all oh, that's so nice. i taste this meat and i'm like yep that's oxidized. So I dumped a bottle of Madeira in it and uh, said it was supposed to be that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Madeira is already so oxidized yeah. on its own that it actually kind of helped it and masked a lot of that flavor. Huh. Drank through it. A lot of people really liked it and were like, oh, I really like this like Madeira note that you got. I'm like, yeah, there's a whole bottle in the ground. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's your worst mishap? Jackfruit. Yeah. I bought a jackfruit at a Asian market. It was like 20 pounds. 
-hmm. and I split it open with my best knives and started getting the fruit out. I was like, okay, this maybe it wasn't the most sanitized thing, so I'm gonna uh, sterilize it in a pot, you know, and get it up to pasteurization temps. Um, apparently, that's how you make a uh, vegan meat replacement, uh, uh -huh. like a pulled pork replacement. I have not puked from alcohol <laughs> in uh, what year is it? Since college, Lucky and you. Uh, that's a little while back. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I I hurled off my porch. Uh, it, it tasted like nasty bong water with uh, raw chicken in it. Mm. I I have never had something like that before. Uh, apparently, it was too uh, unripe. I had uh, opened it too soon. I, you're looking up on YouTube to, how, how you knock on the side of it to know if it's ripe. I yeah. well, I've never eaten one before. Um, I got it wrong. I'm never gonna forget that. It does make a fantastic faux pulled pork. I so I've been told. <laughs> um, were you guys on the subreddit when that durian basil? I tried it. Oh, they sent me a bottle. God, I forgot they sent you that. I took that actually to try with Tony. It tasted like regret, sadness. <laughs> was kind of oxidized you better link that thread by the way please uh, link that video. thread it was reddit makes a mead and they picked five ingredients it was oh i remember this it was passion I, fruit general uh, soy sauce durian oh, yeah, basil yeah, 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 yeah. and rose water oh yeah. it was the rose water i was forgetting it was something i made it, a durian wine years ago it didn't turn out great but it was perfectly drinkable um, I can't imagine putting chicken sauce in it. But um, <laughs> before I forget, by the way, the um, mead Discord that Storm and I are in does have a request for you. Oh, what's that? Takis mead. Okay. Yeah, I saw that, and I didn't. I didn't know what that was. They're very, very spicy chips. Yeah, they're kind of uh... like um, they're corn based, right? <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're like they're like roll-ups yes and you can get them uh you can get them spicy you can get, you can them, get like... them in unnecessarily hot levels yeah yeah, yeah. there's the there's hmm. a little like bodega by Takis Fuego. 10 years ago or so that i used <laughs> to live by and i would go in there and get a sun drop soda and takis and it was like finding the two most obscure snack items you could find in one place <laughs> i think i i posted about it on reddit mm -hmm. the other day and you this has Reapers, Ghost Peppers, and... Yeah, that was the one that you else? said you did a wash on it that I wanted yeah, to... Yeah, I washed them twice with vodka. And so... And so you toss the vodka or you yeah. use the vodka? Well, okay. so kind of. I, I put the... I After washing them twice with vodka, I rinsed them in cold water uh, and then threw them right in. in mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in primary. Seeds, no nose. seeds? Uh, no seeds. So just okay. the, the papery dried flesh. Chicken. And then the <laughs> the vodka I actually poured into a, a big dish in my dehydrator and turned into pepper oil. Oh, that's mm. cool. I evaporated the entire bottle of vodka and ended up with uh, about six, seven milliliters of pure hot. Just a ton mm. of capsaicin oils. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I gave it to a friend of mine and he said that he uh, dipped a toothpick in it mm -hmm. and then put that in uh, like a three gallon pot of chili and swirled it around and it was enough to heat the entire pot of chili wow so let's see this ghost pepper reaper whatever so there it's kind of like this purpley color ah there we go yeah, yeah there it's catching the light uh so it's 18 to 21 percent alcohol by volume uh depending on the batch to batch and i use uh four reapers uh five uh habaneros uh, six, six red chilies and a poblano uh, in a one-gallon batch. Do you dry these first? Uh, I buy them dried. Okay. Um, the, pl the poblano, I uh, tend to steam on the stove just to break it up a little bit. Um, I will quarter it and uh, steam it and then toss it all in a bag. This one was a particularly hot. Um, this one I was doing with scorpions. In s I got to check my notes. I'm pretty sure it was scorpions uh, instead of uh, ghosts or reapers. And... <laughs> it's a religious experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how I, is it two hours from now? <laughs> uh, wash your hands. Next morning's a little rough. <laughs> uh, you can usually feel it the day afterwards. Yes. Um, so in addition to right now. 
Uh, right yeah, now, yeah. now, right now it's good. Like I can feel it. It's it's hot here, and then it fades pretty quickly. Um, the way I treat the peppers, I think, is right because it doesn't it doesn't stay too long. But I can feel it's here and now a little lower, and it sits in your belly and stays warm down there. Well, I want to thank you guys for uh, sharing your knowledge for doing everything that you do to help grow the mead making community online because there's it's interesting how there's like little smatterings of mead makers all over the net and they're starting it's like the mead we're talking about they're all starting to kind of find each other and share these best practices and share these wow. things and unfortunately talk each other more too i mean that's <laughs> and i'm i'm not that's... a helper on that. No, no i i i gotta say for sure yeah as much as i try to be helpful yeah i mean it, that's part of every great community is, <laughs> is is knowing how to give each other a noogie when you need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.